Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're taking a look at the immune system. Specifically, we're focusing on one division of the immune system called the innate division. Now to begin with, we need to talk about the differences between the adaptive arm and the innate arm of the immune system. Firstly, the adaptive arm of the immune system is a specific response division. So it responds specific or specifically to what pathogen, i.e. what bacteria or virus or fungi, is targeting the body for attack. And it responds in very specific ways to target, attack and destroy that pathogen. Now the innate division is non-specific. It really doesn't care what is trying to attack and harm us. It will respond the same way regardless. So the adaptive side, it responds specifically depending on what type of pathogen is attacking us. The innate really doesn't care. A nice analogy I like to use is that of a house. So if somebody's trying to get into our house, attack us inside the house, well, it needs to get through the first line of defense. It needs to get through the walls, it needs to get through the doors, it needs to get through the windows, it needs to get through the roof. Now, walls, doors, window, roof, doesn't really care what type of intruder is trying to get in. It's gonna stop it the same way. That is the innate division of the immune system. But if we think about what the adaptive side is, that is like us hiring guards to walk around the premises of the house. These guards know how to respond depending on the type of attacker. Does that attacker have a knife or a gun? Their response will be specific to that. So that is the analogy that I like to use between innate and adaptive. Let's focus on the innate a little bit more. That's gonna be the focus of today's lecture. Like I said, it's non-specific, but a couple of other things that help us classify the innate system is it's not just non-specific, it has no memory. Now, what does that mean? Once it has targeted and attacked a pathogen, whether it's a bacteria or a virus or a fungi or some sort of uh, microbial agent, once it's attacked it and destroyed it, it doesn't remember it, which means it can't adapt itself so that next time it comes along, it's more efficient at targeting and killing it. So it has no memory of what it's killed. The other thing is that it's the first line of defense. And this makes total sense. Especially when we think about the analogy I just used. Walls, doors, windows, roof, and so forth. They're the first line of defense. So let's now focus a little bit more on the innate system because there's two more arms of the innate system that we should focus on. So the first of which is the external division. And so the external division primarily includes things like skin and mucous membranes. So let's write that down. The external division is mainly skin and mucous membranes. Now this is gonna be different to the other arm of the innate, which is the internal division. And we'll get to that in a second. But again, both of these, external and internal, they're still our first line of defense and they're still non-specific and they don't have a memory. So let's focus on the external skin, mucous membrane. So firstly is our skin. We know that when you're looking at me and I'm looking at you, I'm looking at your epidermis. Now your epidermis is the most superficial layer of your skin and it's made up of epithelia. So let's write this down. So we've got our epidermis and our epidermis is made up of epithelia. Remember the four tissue types of the body. Your whole body is made up of only four tissue types. Epithelia, connective, nervous, and muscle. And so our skin made of epithelia, specifically, it's a type of epithelia called stratified squamous epithelia. Stratified means many layers, squamous means squished. So these cells are actually many layers of these squished, dead, pancake looking cells. Makes total sense. They're dead, which means that it doesn't matter if they get damaged or they slough away, that's the term we use. And there's many layers so that it protects what's underlying. Perfect. 
So that's first line, right? That's the very first thing, but that's not all we have for our skin. Our skin has oil glands. So we've also got what's called sebaceous oil glands. And these sebaceous oil glands release an oil. And importantly, this oil has two important properties that make it protective for us against microbial agents. These properties include things like it is filled with unsaturated fatty acids. Now, what's that got to do with anything? That is a poor energy source for microbes. Viruses, bacteria, fungi really don't like using unsaturated fatty acids for energy. So it's not a great environment for them to grow and thrive on. The other thing is that our sebaceous oil glands, they have a pH of around about three to five, which again, makes it an inhospitable environment for microbes. So that's our sebaceous oil glands, but we know our skin also secretes sweat. Now, what's the benefit of sweating? Well, we don't sweat necessarily to get rid of microbes. We sweat to cool us down through conduction. So we have sweat and we release mostly water and a bit of salt onto our skin. And as the breeze comes through, it takes the heat away and we cool down. But when we do sweat, it allows one, it's a salty environment. So again, not great for microbes. And two, it helps wash away any microbes that may be on the skin. So sweat's important too. We have hair. And this hair we know we have on our head, our eyelashes, and our nasal cavity as well. And it allows for us to trap particles because with hair often comes mucus as well. So we've got mucus. And other various secretions. And some of these secretions, for example, include secretions of our tears and our saliva. Now what's important about these secretions of tears and saliva is they have enzymes, enzymes called defensins and enzymes called lysozymes. Simply put, these enzymes just tear apart any invading pathogens and kill them. So that protects our eyes, it protects our nasal cavity, it protects our oral cavity. But if we do tend to inhale something, luckily for us in our airways, we have little hairs called cilia. Now cilia is different to the hair on our head, eyelashes and nose. Cilia can actually move, they beat. Now when you inhale particles or pathogens, it gets caught in the mucus in our airways and the cilia can move these pathogens caught in the mucus. We can cough it up or we can swallow it down our esophagus into our stomach. And you might be thinking, wait, let's bring in it more internally. But that's okay and I'll tell you why is because in our stomach, we have gastric secretions of a pH of one to three. And that pH will denature. It basically unfolds the proteins that comprise those bacteria, viruses, fungi, or whatever microbial agents they are. So luckily for us, our external defenses here, our first line of defense is quite extensive. Now, this is external. What if it starts to get more inside? So let's think of our bloodstream, for example. Well, what can happen here is once it's inside, there's three more divisions or three more different ways that we can, using our innate immune system, attack and destroy these invading pathogens. Let's take a look. So we have a way to use our cells. So we have cellular defenses. We have in addition to cells, we have chemicals and we have physiological responses. So once it's inside, we have cellular responses, chemical responses, physiological responses. Let's focus on the cells. So firstly, what we have are cells called phagocytes, phagocytic cells. So 
phagocytes. So let's have a look at this word. Phage. Phage means to eat. Cyte is a cell. These are cells that eat. So we've got a couple of different types of phagocytic cells that we should talk about here that's part of the innate immune system. We have neutrophils. And we have macrophages. So let's first look at neutrophils. Neutrophils are one of our white blood cells. Do you remember the way to remember your white blood cells? Remember, never let monkeys eat bananas. Remember that mnemonic? Never let monkeys eat bananas. Now you can get rid of the end of those words. And what do we have? We've got neutrophils. We've got lymphocytes. We've got monocytes. We've got eosinophils. And we've got basophils. Look at that. And the great thing is, it also shows us these white blood cells in most abundant to least abundant. So neutrophils are our most abundant white blood cell. So it is a phagocytic cell. It targets, engulfs, so takes this pathogen in. Now, the thing with neutrophils is the pathogen is usually bacterial. So it usually, not always, but usually it's bacterial. That's what it engulfs and it digests it inside of it. So that's what the neutrophils do. They are the very first white blood cell that gets to the site of infection. So it's the first there. It's the first one that arrives. And again, targets, attacks, engulfs, and gets rid of that pathogen, generally bacteria. Macrophages work similarly. So both undergo phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is the targeting, the grabbing a hold of, the engulfing, and the destruction inside of whatever that pathogen may be. Macrophages include, you've got something called wandering macrophages and fixed macrophages. So let's write this down. You've got wandering, macrophages, and you have fixed macrophages. So wandering macrophages are the macrophages floating through our bloodstream. These are like the monocytes. So a monocyte is an example of a wandering macrophage. And have a look here. Here's the monocytes. We spoke about neutrophils, both are phagocytic cells. But monocytes floating through our bloodstream, when there's an infection, it goes to that area. And once it jumps out of the bloodstream to go to the damaged tissue, it turns into a macrophage and it can engulf and destroy that, whatever that pathogen may be. But here's the other thing. You might be thinking, well, what's the difference then between neutrophils and macrophages? Why isn't a neutrophil a macrophage? Neutrophils generally attack bacteria and engulf and destroy. What macrophages can do is in addition to, not all of them do this, but what they can do, once they ingest and destroy, they can pull off parts of the pathogen generally proteins that are used like flags for these pathogens that say, hey, I don't belong to you, I'm a virus. I belong to me and not belong to you. So it can take that antigen and present it to its surface. And these are called antigen presenting cells, APCs. So macrophages can become APCs, antigen presenting cells. And to present these antigens allows for the adaptive immune system, the TMB cells to go, hey, I recognize that, you don't belong here, I'm gonna attack and destroy. So that's perfect. So you've got wandering macrophages like monocytes floating through the bloodstream, and you've got fixed macrophages that sit in the tissues and they don't move. So for example, there's a whole bunch of different types. So you've got histiocytes. So histiocytes are in our connective tissue. Right? You've got Kupfer cells, and Kupfer cells are in our liver. You've got alveolar cells, they're in our lungs. You've got microglia, and microglia are in our nervous system. 
So there's heaps of different types of fixed macrophages. Again, they identify things that shouldn't be there, engulf and destroy. But there's other types of cells. So while we have these ones, the phagocytic cells, the other type you should know is called NK cells. So we've also got NK cells. Now these are called natural killer cells. What a name, natural killer cells. How tough does that sound? Now these natural killer cells, what they can do is a couple of different things. Again, they target and destroy they don't care what it is, they target and destroy really. And have a think, what they do is this. They can release a couple of things. They can release something called perforins or perforins, and they can release something called granzymes. Now, if it releases perforins, it perforates. It just puts holes in the cell that's invading the body the pathogen, puts a hole in it. Now if there's a hole in it, there's gonna be a concentration difference from inside that cell to the fluid of the body. And usually that cell's far more concentrated. So fluid rushes into that cell, it swells and bursts. So that's how NK cells can kill some pathogens. Granzymes are a little bit different. Granzymes enter that cell and they trigger that cell to undergo apoptosis. They trigger that invading cell to undergo apoptosis. Now apoptosis is a programmed cell death. So programmed cell death means it triggers a couple of important chemicals and proteins to say, hey, it's time to die. And what it does is the cell membrane of that cell remains intact and the inside just degrades and destroys itself. It's a clean way of a cell to trigger a cell to die. This is different to necrosis. In necrosis where a cell is dying, the walls are destroyed and the cell sort of just falls apart into the environment. Apoptosis is not the case. This is a Greek term which means when the leaves fall off the trees in autumn, which is quite beautiful, but it's saying it's time to die. So that's apoptosis and that's what these NK cells can perform. So they're the cells. Now let's take a look at the chemicals inside of our body. So the chemicals inside of our body can include our complement proteins. So we can release something called complement proteins. Now these complement proteins, there's like 30 of them, around about 30 complement proteins. And the way that it works is when one pr complement protein is released, it triggers the release and activation of the next protein, which triggers the release and activation of the next and the next and the next and the next, and it's this cascading effect. What do these complement proteins do? They complement aspects of the innate division of the immune system. So that means they complement phagocytic cells to do their job, like macrophages. They complement what we're gonna talk about here, which is the process of inflammation. So basically, complement proteins complement or support innate immune responses. Another group of chemicals that are important here are the cytokines. cytokines. And there's a couple of different types of cytokines. This isn't an extensive list, but things like interleukins and interferons. I mean, there's heaps. Tumor, tumor necrosis factors and things like that. What do they do? So cytokines also complement the immune system. So you might be thinking how are they different. All right, here's the difference. Complement proteins are proteins. Cytokines aren't just proteins, which they can be. They can be glycoproteins, so proteins with sugars attached to them. But the big difference is this. Cytokines don't just complement the innate immune system. They also complement the adaptive immune system. So for example, interleukins. Inter means between, leukin means white blood cell. So interleukins, when they're released, they basically call upon the white blood cells and say, hey, I need a hand. For example, and I rubbed it off the lymphocytes. So you've got your B cells, for example, your B lymphocytes, it can, which are part of the adaptive immune system. It can call them in and say, hey, I need your help here to target and destroy. 
this part. So that's interleukins, part of cytokines. Interferons are interesting. They're released by cells that are, I'll actually write this down, right? So the interleukins, they call upon white blood cells. Interleukins are actually released when a cell is attacked by a virus. And it says, hey, I'm attacked by a virus. And then that calls in the T cells to come, which is again, part of the adaptive immune system to attack and destroy that cell that's invaded by the virus. So these are just cytokines. So these are some of the chemicals of the internal defenses. Let's now focus on the physiological responses, which there's prim primarily two associated with the innate immune system. We have inflammation, and we have fever. Now I'm just having a look where I can draw some stuff because I want to draw the process of inflammation. So let's have a look. So inflammation is this, uh, the way I like to explain it to my students is inflammation is like when a friend is coming over to visit. It's great in the short term, it's horrible in the long term. You're like, okay, you're getting annoying now, you need to go away. So inflammation is a good thing, short term. Long term, you need to get rid of it because it can lead to damaged cells over time and that's not a good thing. So let's focus on what happens during inflammation. So what I might do is I'm just gonna very quickly wipe off this internal part here and draw it up in this little spot right here. So what I have is a blood vessel and I'm gonna have some cells associated with that blood vessel. All right, inflammation by definition is damage that occurs to vascularized tissue. Here's some tissue, it's got a dedicated blood supply. You can call this vascularized tissue. If tissue that doesn't have a dedicated blood supply is damaged, inflammation probably won't occur. And you might think, well, what tissue of the body is, has no dedicated blood supply? Cartilage. Cartilage has no dedicated blood supply. Superficial layers of our epithelium. Notice how you don't get inflammation if you have very superficial scratches because it doesn't have a dedicated blood supply. But if it scratches deeper, then you've damaged vascularized tissue, inflammation occurs, right? So cartilage, avascular, no dedicated blood supply. Therefore, when cartilage is damaged, inflammation rarely occurs, not never occurs, rarely occurs, but that also means it's really hard, it takes a long time for that tissue to repair and fix, because inflammation is an important part of attacking, destroying, invading pathogens, but also triggering the regeneration and fixing of damaged tissue. So here's a blood vessel, here's some vascularized tissue. This vascularized tissue is now damaged because something has happened, whether it be some trauma or whatever. So it's damaged. What happens is these cells release important chemicals. So some of the chemicals it can release include prostaglandins. This is a really important one, which I've done multiple lectures on prostaglandins and the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that target prostaglandins. And it can also trigger the release of histamine. And you know what, there's one more we should probably say that it triggers the release of bradykinins. These are probably three of the most important pro-inflammatory chemicals released during the process of inflammation. What all three of these chemicals do? Now again, prostaglandins are released by damaged cells. It's made from the cell membranes of broken cells. Histamine is released by mast cells, generally when there's some allergen or some immune particle that's triggered that mast cell to release histamine. And bradykinins are triggered to be released when any vascularized tissue is damaged. But all of them do similar or overlapping jobs that you need to be aware of when it comes to inflammation. So one of the things that they do is they trigger the blood vessel to dilate. So now this blood vessel is dilating. So I'll get rid of that. And now you've got this widened blood vessel. So one, it's triggered dilation. So I'm just gonna take inflammation here. I'll get rid of fever for a sec. I'll write it up in a second. So it triggers vascular dilation, known as vasodilation. What does that mean now? Vasodilation means more blood can go to this area. Where do our white blood cells sit? In our blood. So that means more 
Blood cells, white blood cells, immune cells can come to this area to target, attack, destroy any invading pathogens and fix the area. Beautiful. The other thing that these things do is they make the blood vessel really permeable. So increases vascular permeability. Increases vascular permeability. Why is that important? So that the white blood cells, like the monocytes and the macrophages and the neutrophils, for example, so they can leak out. So they can get out of the blood vessel to the tissue to attack and destroy. So these chemicals vasodilate and increase vascular permeability. Every time you get inflammation, what do you always find associated with inflammation? Called the cardinal signs of inflammation. You get redness, heat, pain, and swelling. Redness because more blood is going to the area. Heat, because blood carries the heat of the body to that area. Pain, for a couple of different reasons. If it's swelling in this area, there's gonna be pressure put on our nociceptors, our pain receptors, that are gonna be located in tissue. So there's gonna be pain receptors here. The pressure of the fluid buildup or the direct damage can trigger that. Plus, prostaglandins, histamines, and bradykinins can directly stimulate nociceptors because it's good to say, hey, this area is in pain, don't use it, we need to fix it, right? And you've got swelling again because of all the fluid that's leaking out. So this is inflammation. A lot of the drugs that we take target for inflammation, that is, target these things. So NSAIDs target prostaglandins. Antihistamines target histamine, for example. And there's not a lot for bradykinins, but there are some things. All right, so that's one of the physiological responses. The second is fever. Let's talk about fever very quickly. So we've got fever as another physiological response. Fever is super interesting, right? What happens with fever is that you've got things called pyrogens. Pyro, you ever heard the term pyro? If, have you ever called somebody a pyro, pyromaniac? Someone who loves fire, who loves heat? Okay, pyrogen is something that stimulates heat. And pyrogens can be actual uh, pathogens themselves, or they can be cytokines. And when they're released, they travel to the hypothalamus. So they travel to the hypothalamus. Do you remember where the hypothalamus is? Hypothalamus is base of the brain. It is the control center of the autonomic nervous system, so fight or flight, rest and digest, and the endocrine system to release a whole cascading uh, array of hormones. It also sets our temperature level, our thermostat. Remember, our thermostat is set generally at 38 degrees Celsius. But if a pyrogen is present, again, whether it's a virus or a bacteria or maybe it's a cytokine, it takes this thermostat and goes, nah, 38 is not right. Let's bump it up to 40, 41 degrees Celsius. Now, what does that mean? Your body now thinks that 40, 41 degrees is the normal body temperature. Which means if you're now, if you're at 38, but it thinks 40, 41 is what we should be at, 38 is now cold. Because it goes, well, that's lower than it should be. That's cold. So you should be cold. Which means start shivering. So you start to shiver, even though your body temperature is starting to go up. What does shivering do? It tells the muscles to contract, relax, contract, relax, contract, relax. You release heat. You'll, you get warmer. What's the other thing that happens? Your blood vessels in your periphery constrict pulling all the heat from your blood deep into your body. Again, increasing your body temperature. You start to get really hot, but you feel cold. What's the benefit of all this? Couple of things. One is that the benefit of fever is that it makes uh, our immune cells better at functioning. Immune cell, so increases immune cell function. The warmer the temperature, the better they function. The other thing, is that it decreases the ability of uh, uh, pathogens to divide. Decreases pathogen reproducibility. Amazing. So it's to our benefit, but again, like inflammation, to a point. People always ask, is fever something that we should always try and get rid of? as soon as we have it, or should we keep it? Well, it depends. 
And I know that's a horrible answer, but it's like inflammation. Sometimes inflammation is good, sometimes it's not. Same way as sometimes fever is good, sometimes it's not. All right, so what we've got here, and I'm gonna get out the road so you can see it, is this is our summary of the innate division of the immune system. So I hope you enjoyed that. I'm Dr. Mike. Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. If you enjoyed this video, please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you wanna contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic, at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.